Hello and welcome. Pastor John here. Um, here we go again. And we're going to continue in our um, going through the Bible series. And we're still in the historical books. And we're going to be reading the uh, from the book of Ezra today. All right. So please open your Bibles. Um, turn to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. That's Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. And please read along. Come along. Let's read, let's read together. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were rebuilding a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. So they approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders and said, Let us build with you. For we worship your God just as you do. We have sacrificed him ever since King Ashardon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other leaders of Israel replied, You may have no part in this work. We alone will build a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne. God bless the reading of his word. A call to persevere. So, what we just read here, a little bit of background, is uh, the book of Ezra as part of the um, Hebrew, the historical books. We had mentioned that. And um, just a bit more about the historical books. Um, the historical, bo historical books are the 12 books uh, that range from uh, the book of Joshua to the book of Esther. So, they cover the time period um, of entering the promised land, right, the conquest, to the post-exile to it, so after the Babylonian captivity. So um, it's quite a long um, period of time. And um, here in this um, part, we see um, and understand how um, the Persian king Cyrus had issued a decree letting the Hebrew exiles return to the homeland. Uh, in Judah, and that took place in several groups, several stages, and it began round about 539 BC. We don't know the exact date, but round about 539 BC, and so a small group, a small remnant of people uh, actually returned. So God had um, uh, moved uh, uh, the hearts, uh, the heart of the uh, the Persian leader, the king, uh, to let the people go to to go back to. Uh, their homeland in Judah to um, re-establish their nation, right? Uh, however, the truth is, just for, uh, as a you know, little side note, maybe maybe something like one one out of ten people went; the rest stayed in their um, you know after seventy years in Babylonian captivity, they remained there. So, round about it is estimated. We're not sure for sure, but maybe one out of ten. So maybe ten out of hundred people. Returned. So here, the goal, Ezra, um, the goal is to rebuild the temple, God's house, and to regroup and reestablish their nation. All right, so that's the context. And yeah, this is quite a, quite a passage. So um, the topic here uh, that we, we get is, and we can consider is, what does it mean when God calls us to persevere? What does it mean when God calls us to persevere? So, um, as we go through this passage, we see that um, the Israelites, the Israelite leaders, uh, they know God's will, right? We have Zerubbabel, uh, Jeshua, right? And they're there and they, they um, stand firm. They know God's will. They stand firm and they're not willing to compromise. So in verse 2, when they say, you know, they trust God, but, um, you know, uh, King Esardon, uh, as, as far as we know, uh, or Esarhadon, um, he apparently worshipped Yahweh God, right, the Lord God, but also other gods. 
Well, that's really not, that's not worshiping God at all. So it's a little bit tricky there, right? And so in verse 3, we see how Zerubbabel, that is the governor of the Hebrew people, and uh, Jeshua, the priest, um, they discern uh, the evil intentions of the people who say, hey, we're going to help you, right? We're going to come along and help you. And um, as it turns out in verse 5, um, the... Um, Indeed, uh, um, Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the others see through that evil plan. And uh, so there's opposition, right? And um, they reveal um, what, what really is going on in their hearts, right? So they're, they're, they're not interested in helping the Hebrew, the Israelite people rebuild the temple. So uh, just to remind ourselves too, and if you didn't know, I didn't know, I looked it up too, is uh, that the opposition at this point is to to building uh, bringing the building of the temple about is so strong um and along with the temple along with the protective walls remember when the uh, if you read the bible that the babylonians they tore down the entire walls of the of the city of jerusalem and um, destroyed uh, whatever could be destroyed and took everybody took most people captive um so the so the rebuilding of the temple and the protective walls at this point come to a complete, uh, almost complete, yeah, to a full standstill. But, which is really neat, God doesn't let, you know, people, you know, leave people to their own devices. And that's awesome. That's how our Lord God is. So the rebuilding of the walls begins again under Nehemiah in 444 BC. So here's a little tip if you're interested in the uh, history part here and the events, uh, real people, real events here in the Bible, you can read Ezra, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah together, where they they are they they really belong together. Um, so um, you want to read them, and also read the book of Haggai. That's the prophet Haggai, to help you put all these events together. Ezra and Nehemiah. If you read it just in one, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah just in one go, um, it may seem a little bit disjointed and. Um, we can't, the, the, you know, it's not, you know, we, it doesn't seem chronological in that sense. But if you read Ezra and Nehemiah along with the prophet Haggai, that'll help you put all these events together. So, so it's more coherent and cohesive. All right. So that's just a tip. So Nehemiah, read Ezra, read the book of Nehemiah and read the book of Haggai. It'll help you. So, all right. So what does it mean? And uh, what does God's call to persevere mean for us as believers, as Christians? What does it mean? What does, what does God's call to persevere mean for us as uh, followers of Jesus Christ? So our call as believers is basically to persevere with God's help, right? In the midst of persecution, hardship, trial, and suffering, right? There is... Uh, the temptation to compromise, uh, you know, follow what everybody else is doing um, or something like uh, because everybody else is doing this, that means, uh, you know, I have to do it too or so, uh, which may not be exactly the case um, outside of God's will. If it, for example, violates um, like the Ten Commandments or um, or just ask yourself something like this, um, might the decision I'm trying to make, um, does this decision... Uh, honor God, right? Is it a God-fearing decision? And can I do this in Jesus' name, right? So if if both answers to that or one of them is no, then don't do it, right? Just as a little point of departure. However, as much as, as you spend more and more time in, in the Bible, in God's word, uh, you'll have a more sense of what is true and what is false because we have God's living word, that is the Bible, and um, to help with spiritual discernment. So that's a big help uh, to persevere um, in hardship um, and persecution uh, as uh, Christians. So what does this mean to you? What does that mean for you then? So we also want to surrender to God at all times. James, uh, the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 12, reminds us. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those 
who love him. I'll read it again. God bless you with this word. James 1 verse 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So, you know, in our society, often it is like, you know, people, you know, somebody may say, or whoever it is, I want it now. And I don't care about anything or anybody else. I want it now. Uh, this is these are my rights, my freedom, and whatever. I don't care about anything or anybody else but myself. And well, you know, the truth is, uh, biblically speaking, uh, often people do get it um, right now. But if it's outside of God's will, um, and often, many times it is, then the outcome is not just undesirable, uh, but may actually have um, um, earthly and eternal consequences. So just as a tip, right? Remember those two questions to ask yourself, can I do this? Uh, will this decision I'm making honor God? And can I do this in God's, in Jesus' name? Right? Both of them have to be yes and that can be only done through your time you spend in God's word in the Bible and following um, um, scripture the Bible's lead God's revealed will is there to help you and praying of course um, with God's help so uh, lastly it also means to endure and persevere means um, uh, to discern through the Holy Spirit Right, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, true and false, as well as good and evil. And here we have a, a Bible passage. I hope you will highlight this one. It's in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13. Ephesians chapter 6, in the New Testament, verses 10 to 13. It's, it's, the man may title is the whole armor of God. So I'll read it to you. Well, let's read it. Paul writes, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. So, God bless you of his word. So, that's very important, the whole armor of God. And also, lastly, we want to consider, uh, it means to persevere, is to embrace uh, that God will ultimately see us through, through our Lord Jesus Christ, to reach our eternal home, right? Um, as we become, as we as we turn to Christ, God calls us and we respond to God's call, to Jesus' call to become his children, his adopted children, as Christians, um, we may or may not see um, the uh, desired outcome that we may think it might be something maybe like in our lifetime. It's a very important truth. Um, you know, on the other side is like the teaching or... Um, some, it's, it's just untruthful. Right? It's, it's a lie that people then say, once somebody becomes a Christian or a believer, everything is super hunky-dory, right? Uh, you know, I'm wealthy, prosperous, healthy. And, um, well, that's not really, that's not what the Bible tells us. So stay away from, uh, you know, people who proclaim or, or unfortunately pray for those people that uh, God be merciful to them because that's not what the Bible tells us, right? Uh, there you might want to read um, Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and uh, especially Hebrews chapter 12. See what the Bible really has to say about all that, all right? Um, however, um, there is hope, of course, eternally speaking, um, because, um, as I said, Jesus will help us to reach our eternal home, and Jesus promises us this in John chapter 14 verses 2 to 3 that's in john chapter 14 verses 2 to 3 we read there is more than enough room in my father's home if this were not so would i have told you that i'm going to prepare a place for you when everything is ready 
I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. God bless you, you must word. So we have Jesus' promise here, and that promise stands and remains firm for all of us as Christians, as believers uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you and keep you.